So I want to take a minute, you know, and I want you to come with me, and I want you to think about a week ago last Friday. Do you remember what you did a week ago last Friday? What you were wearing? What you had for dinner? How long did dinner last? Do you remember what you ate? Who you went with? Did you know that person well? Did you have anything to drink? How much did you drink? And what did you wear again? Did you text anybody to let them know where you were or what you were doing? How long did dinner last? Can you prove any of this? <clears throat> now I'm going to ask you all these same questions again. And only this time, a, a week ago last Friday, you were raped. And when I ask you all these questions again, we're going to look at all of your decisions. Everything that you did that maybe uh, didn't protect you from being raped or maybe even helped you get raped. In other words, all your bad choices. This is what it's like for victims of sexual assault to get it, go through prosecution and investigation of a sexual assault. Only many times over, and sometimes over the course of a year. I'm going to talk to you for a minute about rape in our country. Out of 1,000 rapes, only 344 get reported. Two out of three rapes still to this day go unreported. Out of that 344, only 63 lead to arrest. 63 out of 1,000. Out of that 63, 13 go to prosecution, and only six people end up in jail for committing rape out of 1,000. These are the most recent statistics from the National Crime Victimization Survey. So, how is this happening in our country to this day with all our education? How is this happening? How are offenders succeeding at such a high rate? And how are we failing to protect victims? Well, one of the things I do as a psychologist is I work with victims and I work with rapists. And I learn a lot from them. But I've learned one thing that I think in part helps explain these numbers from someone named Sophie. This is Sophie. She's awesome. And uh, Sophie sleeps like this. She just lays there every day, grunting, snoring, farting, and her total bliss, wide open, exposed, unaware. That's how Sophie is, you can see. Wide open and exposed. So is she. But the difference is, our judgment of them. They both have exactly the same thing in common. They're completely vulnerable. But how we perceive and judge and criticize their vulnerability is the difference between Sophie being adorable and this woman being blamed for her own sexual assault. And one thing that sexual assault is about, and that is vulnerability. The vulnerability that is identified and created and exploited by offenders. And when I was doing this, I looked up the word, thinking a lot about this, I looked up the word vulnerable, and look, found these definitions. Capable of or susceptible to being hurt, in need of special protection or support, open to attack. Like I said, sexual assault is about vulnerability, and it's about the vulnerability that we, in our society, continue to reject. We continue to condemn and criticize victims for what they wear, what they drank, how they made themselves vulnerable. But vulnerability exists on a continuum and is a day-to-day, moment-to-moment part of the human experience. It can be as simple as saying, I love you, and not getting a response. Uh, putting yourself out uh, at work and getting shut down or laughed at, trying to help and being hurt for it. In fact, when we were discussing vulnerability, an acquaintance told me uh, of a 
a very striking example of her son who intervened in a crime. Some women were being harassed and he intervened to try to protect and uh, got his teeth knocked out for it. So that was bad enough, but it wasn't as bad as the response of the medical professionals who um, helped him when he sought medical care and mocked him for helping out, basically saying, well, I guess that was pretty stupid. Why'd you do something like that? I guess you won't be doing that again. And that reflection of, of our society continues. So what does Sophie have to do with this, right? What did Sophie teach me besides that a pug can snore super loud? Um, Sophie taught me that she sleeps like this because she sleeps in a safe house. There's no one there who can hurt her. So what Sophie taught me is there is no vulnerability without danger. So instead of focusing on the vulnerability, we need to fo start focusing on the danger. When you take danger out of the definition of vulnerability, it changes the whole thing. The definition doesn't make any sense anymore. So vulnerability is a moment-to-moment -moment part of the human experience. It's an invitation for us to connect. It's an invitation for us to protect, not exploit. And so offenders who exploit this vulnerability and, and not only exploit it in, in ways of other ways than sexual assault, but exploit it d during sexual assault, not, it's so wrong because not only do they exploit the vulnerability, they get sexually aroused during it. It's really wrong. So the victim too, in part, this reflects the numbers that we saw earlier because the victim is not only vulnerable during the attack, but that victim is vulnerable during the investigation and prosecution and exposure to the community who criticizes and judges and devalues the vulnerability instead of holding the offender accountable. So what I want from you today and what, what I want you to take is I want to be part, I want you to become part of the community that embraces vulnerability, that rejoices in it, that protects it, that accepts vulnerability as an invitation to be open and part of and not to exploit. This is easier to do if we truly believe, if we honestly believe in our heart that there is nothing that we can do to make somebody rape us. There's nothing. There's no drink we can have. There's no clothes we can wear. There's nothing we can do. And once we truly believe that, we can protect vulnerability. And we can focus on what's real prevention, which is holding people accountable for the violations of sexual boundaries and embracing vulnerability as a beautiful, wonderful part of the human condition. And when we do that, the criminal justice system will follow along because the criminal justice system is us. We, as a community, are the judges and the juries and the victims and offenders. And if the offenders learn that we will stop blaming victims and we embrace vulnerability as wonderful and part of being alive, then their exploitation of it will be our focus, not the victim's bad choices. And as a mirror of our society, the criminal justice system will follow along and that will, I believe, will help those numbers. So look what vulnerable becomes without danger. Capable, open, in need of special care or support. I want you to remember that these things are also about vulnerability. So my call to you is, if you see vulnerability, rejoice in it. If you feel vulnerable, embrace it. But if you see it, most of all, protect it. Intervene, protect it, and respect it. And then things will change for us. Like I said, part of my job is I work with rapists, and I work with victims, and I need you to put me out of a job. Thank you.